door slammed. There was a rush upstairs. The man looked at the clock. It was time for his daughter to be home from school. Fourth grade was not going very well. And from the sound of the door slamming, it had not improved. He went up to her room and asked her about her day. It was awful, she said. When she unzipped her backpack at school, her homework was nowhere to be found. Her norm normally charming teacher snarled at the class. The morning dragged on to lunch when none of the cafeteria choices seemed appetizing. The class went outside to the playground, and her best friend decided to play with somebody else. It said hot to top it off. A big kid had made fun of her on the bus. It was a rotten day, she sobbed, and he held her. After several minutes, she stopped quivering. He rubbed her back, and she blew her nose. One more hug. And then he went downstairs. About a half hour later, he, he thought it sounded unnaturally quiet. So he sneaked upstairs to see what was happening. To his surprise, she was down on her knees with her hands clasped and her eyes shut. And she was murmuring something. Honey, he said, is everything all right? I'm okay, Daddy. I'm just praying. That's good, he whispered. What are you praying for? Dad, I've decided I don't like this world, so I'm praying for a new one. <laughs> well, whether she knew it or not, cute as she was, she was rooting herself in thousands of years in Christian tradition. Ever since Jesus appeared among us and died for us on the cross of Calvary, Christians have been praying for a whole new world. That's what lies behind scripture texts like the one we just heard from the 21st chapter of Luke. We're looking for God's kingdom to come. Despite the dark day that our little fourth grader was having, we as Christians affirm every Sunday that Christ, the light of the world, will come again. In our collect today, we prayed for God's grace to, to cast away the works of darkness and to put on the armor of light until he comes for us or until we go to meet him. We stand fast in the Lord against the darkness now so that we'll be able to stand before the Son of Man when he comes again in all his radiant glory. The Advent season begins today. It's always the four Sundays before Christmas. And all together now, what does the word Advent mean? <coughs> coming, coming. It's from the Latin for coming. So in Advent, we prepare for the coming of Jesus. And we focus on three comings. As we get closer to Christmas, we'll look backward to Jesus' first coming as the babe of Bethlehem. Today we begin by looking forward to his second coming at the end of time. We begin our Advent preparations by reflecting on the end of history. But I said there are three comings. And the first two can't be real for us. They have no effect on us unless the third coming is true for us. And the third coming is the coming of Jesus into our lives when we recognize ourselves as sinners and thank God for sending his son to die for us on the cross and believe on his name. When you receive him as Savior and Lord, then the first and the second comings will mean everything to you. If you haven't decided to follow Jesus yet, don't wait any longer. Come to Jesus today. Accept his great invitation to come to him and once you have, you'll never be the same. You know, the Old Testament prophet spoke of Christ's second coming 
as the great and terrible day of the Lord, a day of smoke and fire, clouds and thunder. Zechariah, the prophet, writing some 500 years before Jesus came, said that on that day the Lord would come down and there would be an earthquake on the Mount of Olives just outside Jerusalem. On that day, God will override his natural law and there would be no daytime or nighttime or cold, but there will be light. There will be the light of Christ and the living water of the Holy Spirit. This Advent Sunday, many who haven't come to Jesus yet will be enduring a time of restless yearning while we're making our preparations for the coming of the Lord Jesus. Pastor David reminded us that last Sunday was Christ the King Sunday. And in those lessons depicted Christ as the King of kings and the Lord of lords, coming in glory with all his angels and with all authority to rule the nations. And Jesus picks up, this, picks up the same theme in today's gospel, saying that he will come again with power and great glory. So Advent marks the beginning of the church year. Many of you will notice that this year our gospel lessons change from primarily Mark to Luke. So our reading, if you want to follow along in your bulletins or your Bibles, is in Luke 21, chapters 25 to 36. And there we see Jesus speaks of, of signs in the sun, moon, and stars, and nations in anguish, and men fainting. He confirms another prophet, Amos, who said that the Lord would shake the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land and all nations. Jesus tells us that the powers of heaven will be shaken. We see, as we look around us, God's creation in disorder, nations in anguish and war, and people fainting, which is to say despairing, losing heart and turning away from godly teachings. So don't we already see the signs of the end times? They've already begun to take place. So what does Jesus tell us? He tells us to straighten up, raise our heads because our redemption is drawing near. But as Jesus told the curious, no one knows the day or the hour of his coming, only the Father Jesus says to stand up and lift up your heads and to be always on watch, to be aware, to keep alert, to be vigilant, stay awake, be on guard so that you might be able to stand before the Son of Man. Watch, pray for the strength to stand before Jesus when he comes again in glory. We will all stand before him when he comes again on Judgment Day. And that day will be a great day for believers, but a terrible day for those who've rejected God. As St. Augustine wrote long ago, let us not resist his first coming, that we may not tremble at his second. As we look at today's world, it's clear that most people aren't giving Jesus or Judgment Day much of a thought. Halloween, that is All Hallows Eve, and Thanksgiving were barely over before the stores began to play Christmas songs as background sound for the frenzy of buying and wrapping and overspending. The pumpkins and sc scarecrows and cornucopia of October and November get hastily put aside to make way for cheap tinsel and cute music and flashing lights. The signal is clear. There's no time to sink into the quiet of the season that is promised after Thanksgiving. By the Friday morning that follows Thanksgiving, Black Friday, <laughs> as it's now known, bursts suddenly upon us with the raucousness of commercial Christmas. And the stores open around 5 or 6 a.m. 
And the Christmas season gets so lost in the credit card world of unlimited desire and limited resources. Shopping and decorating replace what Advent is meant to be, thoughtful and prayerful preparation for the coming of Jesus. When I was a boy, <laughs> all this used to wait until after Thanksgiving. See a few nods? Surely four weeks was enough time for the merchants to make their Christmas profits. Not anymore. People seem to have more needs these days, greater expectations, and more preparations to make for the holidays. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not Uncle Scrooge who would bah humbug a little Christmas cheer, nor am I the Grinch who would steal Christmas. Yet something is wrong with this picture. The season is longer and the presents are more expensive, tempting people to misuse and waste their resources. And yet the gifts of the spirit of this age do not satisfy. More somehow seems to be less. More families are fractured. More school children are confused, afraid, depressed, and without purpose. Society grows more restless and immoral, and people yearn for something more. They're frustrated. They don't really know what they're looking for. But commercialism isn't the main problem. The problem is that Christmas consumerism too often drowns out the prayerful time that should come with Advent and drains not only the season of its meaning, but perhaps even the rest of the year. The scriptures will study this season, tell us that we're called to focus on the abundant life found in Christ alone and not on a frantic rush to, sh to shop till we drop. Christmas is not meant to be just a day of celebration. It's meant to be preceded by a month of contemplation. But Advent, sadly, has been largely lost somewhere between the Thanksgiving turkey and the Christmas Eve last-minute sales. So here we stand at the beginning of Advent. We're the children of light with Christ counting on, on us to tell others about him. We're living in a world full of darkness, of evil deeds, with five killed and more than 40 injured when a car plowed into a parade in Wisconsin. And all the while, the shopping malls are playing, have yourself a merry little Christmas. Instead of this little ditty, Let's begin Advent with reflection on the song we sang earlier, Here I Am to Worship. Light of the world, you step down into darkness. Open to my eyes, let me see. Beauty that made this heart adore you. Hope of a life spent with you. Do you have overwhelming gratitude that Jesus joined us in our darkness and walks beside us? He won't leave us there if we're willing to turn to his light. Open your eyes to see the beauty of holiness that made your hearts adore him. He gives us the sure and certain hope of a life spent with him. You know, the darkness of the sinful world around us dares to creep into the church. In any given Anglican congregation at this time of year, there are two groups of people. One group seeing the blue Advent hangings and hearing the lessons about sin and judgment say, thank God for Advent. The other group says, where are the Christmas decorations? Why aren't we singing carols yet? The more the world outside lights its trees, the more sparkle and glitter it throws about, the more it sings, have yourself a merry little Christmas, the more I want to retreat into the reflective mood of Advent. Advent teaches us to delay Christmas. 
so we can truly experience Jesus as he comes to us. And we need to take a fearless inventory of the darkness. This season is not for the faint of heart. It takes courage to look into the heart of darkness, especially when we might see our sinful selves there. Whatever you're feeling as we come into this season, you'll feel it more intensely. People who are up are really up. People who are down feel really down. Whatever we bring to the season, we will feel it more intensely, and especially when people are decking the halls with boughs of holly and everyone's working hard at being jolly. Temptations, trials, tribulations form the story of the Christian community in the time between Jesus' first coming and his second coming. And, you know, we, we don't know why God delays so long. We don't know why he so often hides his face. Most all of us experience periods when God seems far away, when our prayer life seems dry, when we open God's word and nothing seems to speak to us. We don't know why so many have to suffer so much with so little apparent meaning. We don't know why more and more Christian leaders are turning out to be false teachers who call sin sacred. We don't know why shepherds are failing to be wholesome examples and lead their flocks astray. What we do know is that the King of Kings is coming back in glory to judge the living and the dead. As the prophet Malachi said, the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. And it will be the final breaking in of God upon our darkness. God will fulfill his promise that despite the darkness, there is a Lord of light who cares. God calls for each one of us to stand against the darkness and for the light of Christ. He told us in today's gospel to, to stand up and lift up our heads. And in today's epistle, the apostle Paul told the Christians in Thessalonica that he and Timothy are really living because they're standing fast in the Lord. Do you realize that each one of you has a big impact on your brothers and sisters in Christ. When we see each other standing firm in the Lord, we really live. We're encouraged. Paul said, in, in all our distress, distress and affection, we have been comforted about you through your faith. God's spirit of joy in you is transmitted to me when you stand firm. As Paul wrote, for what thanksgiving can we return to God for you, for all the joy that we feel for your sake before our God? Your faith lifts me up. Your faith rubs off on me. It gives me courage and strength to continue to stand fast against the darkness. But it's hard to stand firm at times. It's always hard to have strong faith, and even harder to show it. We face temptations. We give in to them at times. Sin separates us from God and from each other, and it weakens our faith. And so we need to repent and run to God for forgiveness as quickly as possible so that the joy of our salvation and faith can be restored. And he is so eager to restore us to a right relationship you know, our faith can also be weakened by the anxieties and stresses of this life. When we worry and despair, we're focusing on our circumstances and not on our God of comfort and power. Keep your eyes upon Jesus. Turn your eyes to Jesus. 
In verse 6, Paul tells us that Timothy has brought him good news about three important things in the lives of their brothers and sisters in Thessalonica. He brought good news about their faith, their love, and their longing to see them, to be in fellowship with them. Strong faith, sacrificial love, and frequent fellowship are the things that will enable us to stand firm in the Lord. Faith is about our relationship with God. Love is about our relationships with our neighbors. Yes, even our enemies in the world. Love is how we relate to each other, to our brothers and sisters in Christ. And Christian fellowship is where we find help to grow in our faith and our love. Spending time with the Lord and with each other opens us up to God so he can make our love increase and overflow for each other and for everybody else. Strengthens our hearts so that we will be blameless and holy in the presence of God, our God and Father, when our Lord Jesus Christ comes with all his holy ones. My brothers and sisters, we need each other as the body of Christ. Are you preparing for the Lord this Advent? As you're preparing, think about how much Christian fellowship you're having. The amount and type will be different for each one of us, but the fire of an isolated Christian will go out. Ask yourself uh, if you're in a fellowship group or if you have a weekly meeting with a prayer partner or if you're in any way deliberately focusing on drawing closer to our Lord Jesus Christ. If you've been watching online, come back to the church when you can. There's a vacant chair when you're not here. Fellowship together will help us grow in faith and love, so we'll be an encouragement to each other to stand fast for the Lord. During Advent and throughout our lives, we wait and watch for Jesus to come. We lift up our heads for the Lord himself to come down from heaven. And each generation of Christians has continued to look up for Jesus' second coming. We stay on our toes. We stay awake. And since we have been raised with Christ, we set our hearts on things above. Be alert. Be alert despite all the holiday distractions that, so that you will be able to recognize our Lord Jesus in your husband, in your wife, your parents, your children, your friends, your teachers, but also in what you read in the daily newspapers. Believe it or not, he's in there as well. The Lord is coming. He is always coming. So be alert to his coming. When you have ears to hear and eyes to see, you will recognize him at any moment of your life. Life is Advent. Life is recognizing the coming of the Lord who gave himself for us on the cross. Some of you will remember all those billboards that a appeared around town a few years ago. Remember they had messages on them from God? One of the timely messages during football season goes like this. Let's meet at my house Sunday before the game, God. An even more timely and urgent one as we wait for our Lord's second coming says, don't make me come down there, God. And yet, we do want him to come down here. We eagerly await his coming in glory. The entire Christian life has lived between the first and the second comings of the Lord. In the tension between the way things are and the way things ought to be. We can't expect to receive any lasting comfort from this world. Like the fourth grade girl who had a rotten day in school. There's a lot about this world we don't like. 
So we're praying for a new world. Amen. We're praying, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. To each and to all of us on this first Sunday in Advent, I bring this good news. God will come. His justice will prevail. And he will destroy evil and pain and darkness in all its forms once and for all. To be a Christian is to live every day with those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, but also live most truly in the unshakable hope of those who expect the dawn and the light that only Jesus brings. I close in prayer. Lord Jesus, master of both the light and the darkness, send your Holy Spirit upon our preparations for Christmas. We who have so much to do seek quiet spaces to hear your voice each day. We who are anxious over many things look forward to your coming among us. We who are blessed in so many ways long for the complete joy of your kingdom. We whose hearts are heavy seek the joy of your presence. We are your people walking in darkness yet seeking the light. To you we say, come, King Jesus. Rule over us every step of the way. Amen.